The only foothold you have in the market is your plan. The market's gonna do what it's gonna do. If you're unsure about what your plan is, it's likely to lead to a lot of uh, bad decisions. One of the things to realize is that base hit trades can add up significantly over time. Before I enter the trade, most times I've decided whether or not I'm gonna handle this as a position trade or a swing trade. In terms of position trading the way I think about it, how much of that pullback can you withstand? With swing trades, I'm trying to sell most or all of my position before a meaningful pullback. The environment is absolutely got to be at your back if you're gonna take position trades. You're never gonna sell perfectly. You're gonna sell too soon or too late. That's the way it goes, but you're trying to get the meat of the trend. If I declared to myself this is a position trade, this would still be on and it would be roaring. But that doesn't mean that this swing trade was not a success. My main deciding factor is how much volatility I want in my account with those position trades. So this is what I'd call an opportunistic trade. I'm just spotting an opportunity in a name that I've been following. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailland Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. This episode is brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. You can pick up your copy of this excellent resource down below. It's 100% free. Uh, joining us today in this episode is someone who I always really enjoy chatting the markets with. We have Matt Petralia, a veteran swing trader over 20 years under his belt. Uh, Matt is somebody who's, uh, you know, he approaches trading the right way, very risk focused. Uh, he's got a very balanced, even keeled approach. Uh, Matt, you should kind of run with that, you know, balance even keeled there, there's some slogan that you can come up with there's there. something in there there's something in there Maybe that you should run with equilibrium not sure yeah yeah but <laughs> matt always great to have you on and really looking forward to today's session we're going to dive a little bit into you know trade alignment some position management uh sell rules i know a lot of people have questions about that uh but first of all great to see you again and, and welcome back to the show yeah i'm really happy to be back here our last talk was about two years ago so really really excited to be back here talking with you um, and I really appreciate that intro, some kind words there. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, getting a, a couple more uh, thoughts out on the table here uh, to kind of build on the last interview. And we'll go in a little bit of a di different direction. But thank you for having me back. Yeah, great to have you. And like I, like I mentioned earlier, I think especially for newer traders out there, uh, you'll really benefit from Matt's perspective. Uh, he's going to run through a presentation uh, talking about some really important concepts. And then we're going to run through some charts, some trades, and uh, you know see, see where it goes from there. So uh, Matt, really looking forward to the presentation. I, I know you worked hard on that, which I definitely appreciate. And uh, yeah, let, let's bring that up and dive right in. So what I want to talk about today is, is being in alignment with your trading, with your, you know, with your goals. There's a lot of ways to be in alignment with your strategy, you know, what you're trying to achieve and how you're interacting with the market. And I feel like having worked with a lot of new traders in particular and having obviously been one myself at one point, um, there's a lot of ways where you can become very misaligned. And I think some people may not look at it that way. Um, and I, and I think it's important to kind of shine a light on trying to be in alignment with what you're, what you're trying to achieve. And that requires having an understanding of what you're trying to achieve, what your goals are, what your expectations are, et cetera. So these are all, these are, this is kind of the topic of what I'm going to get into today is being in alignment with your trading plan, your trading strategies and the different kinds of trades like swing trading versus position trading, uh, for me at least are managed completely differently. I guess I shouldn't say 100% differently, but very, very differently. They are managed very, very differently. And I'll you know, start this entire thing by the overall caveat of saying, everything I'm gonna talk about is what works for me, right? And everybody's different. So I'm not prescribing this for anybody, but it's, it's hopefully something to think about, something to you know, determine whether or not it works for you um, and possibly internalize some things that are useful to you. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. So in terms of trade alignment, I'm really talking about um, avoiding misalignments where you are perhaps looking at the wrong time frame, expecting a duration that is not realistic and expecting returns that are uh, not realistic. So it's really focused a lot on what your expectations are um, and how you begin to be in alignment with those expectations and your strategy with a plan. So, you know, the first questions to ask really are defining what your expectations are and do you even have a plan? I mean, those are the key concrete questions to start asking so that we can be in alignment with our goals um, in terms of our strategy and our uh, trading plan. So um, to start off really broadly, three main ways, I think, to align with your trades and your trade, trade strategy. Time frame, duration, and expectations. So for time frame, what I'm talking about is where's your signal coming from? You know, is your signal coming from a, a one minute chart? Is it coming from the weekly chart? Is your signal coming from some macro data point? I mean, you've got to be in alignment with your time frame, And for me, and I'm gonna get into this, 
swing trades come from the daily chart time frame, right? I'm not take I'm not taking them from the five minute time frame. I'm not even taking them from the weekly time frame. The weekly time frame may add a little color, but for me, swing trades come from the daily time frame. That's where my signal comes from. That's where I execute. Um, and then in terms of duration, what are your expectations in terms of duration? I, I've I work with lots of traders that you know, the, the axiom of let your winners run is so ingrained in people's brains that, you know, they'll hit the buy button and then think, all right, my job now is to let my winners run, right? And, and they'll think, all right, I'm in this stock for a lot of good reasons. You know, I know why I entered this stock. I've got, I've got really sound trading logic. I'm, ex I'm expecting this to possibly run out, you know, to 50%, 75%, something like that. Um, and then they get frustrated um, when that doesn't happen in four or five days, right? I mean, duration is something you need to, to take into consideration. Are you entering in a, sw a quick swing trade and expecting a trade to last maybe three, four, five days? Or are you expecting or e even subconsciously expecting, hey, this name's gonna run 75% or this is the next hot name that's gonna run 200%. Um, but that may take two months, three months, right? And you're not in alignment with that psychologically. And that can cause all sorts of management errors. So duration, ec your expectations for duration are, are an extremely important part of this. And then just general, your return or your goal expectations as well. Do you expect uh, a trade to always run to 10R, 15R, 20R? And by the way, I always use R multiples. Um, I find it to be like the, the gold standard of how um, you should discuss uh, returns and risk um, because per percentages can be completely random, right? If you take a, if you take a stop at 10%, you need that stock to move 10% to even get the one R, right? So I'm always talking in terms of R multiples, um, but your expectations can be really out of line in similar ways as the duration, right? You may, you may expect to be entering a name that you even subconsciously think, all right, this is gonna take me out to 20 R. This is the one that I'm gonna sail away on. This is the let your winners run trade, right? Um, but you are actually out of line with how you're executing. Um, and you and you you don't even go into the trade with the actual plan that is realistic because, for instance, if you're taking a swing trade, you it's it's not realistic to expect every single swing trade to run out that far, right? So you can very easily let your uh, profits come right back into you and even turn a win into a loss because your your expectations are just totally out of alignment. And this is uh, what I'm going to get into in more specific ways here going forward. But those are the three main ways I think you need to really be aligned with your trades to help you manage them. It's not some prescriptive uh, secret system here. It's just trying to get your, your mindset in alignment with what you're trying to achieve so that then you can formulate a plan that you can really execute instead of becoming somebody who's like a deer in the headlights. As the, as the trade starts moving, you're not sure exactly what your goals are, what your duration is that you're expecting, your time frame, or any of that, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that as we go forward here. Can I jump in for just one, one point here? Of course. Uh, yeah, going back to the last slide real quick, um, I think it's important to also keep in mind that uh, you have to find the way that's right for you. Uh, I've interviewed, of course, a, a lot of traders and and there's been gunslingers, swing traders who have success that way. That really fits with who they are, their perspective on the markets. But then there's also the people who are looking for that longer duration, the higher return uh, name where just one or two of those trades a year can lead to a 50% you know, annual return. So you can have success either way, uh, but as I'm sure Matt is going to get into, you you got to find the way that works best for you, your perspective, and you have to kind of go into each trade knowing what your goal is and what you have in mind. Um, and also, uh, as Matt, I'm sure, sorry, I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but no, you no, might no. mention this as well. Uh, the The market and what it's offering at that moment might come into play too, where you have to tailor your expectations based on what the market is actually offering. Because if stocks aren't trending, you know, for, for months, it's not going to be a good position trading market. Uh, if stuff isn't following through on breakouts, you might, you know, swing trading is going to work a lot better in that situation. So sorry, sorry to jump in, Matt, but I think that's, that's good to reinforce. No, that's the whole point of doing this together is it's not, not me babbling away. Like, so yep. all the points you made 100% agree with. Um, this is not prescriptive. I'm not trying to pick one or over the other. I will tell you what I favor coming up. There's going to be a slide that says everyone is different in capital letters because yep. that is the, that the point, you know, the point you just made is exactly right. Everyone's going to be different. I'm not trying to prescribe. You should be a swing trader. You should be a position trader. What you do need to be, though, is in alignment with what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to position trade, you need to be operating in alignment with those goals, those expectations, 
and that time frame, right? So that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to illustrate here because I have found a lot of people, and including myself back in the back in the day, to be very confused and misaligned with the way they're trying to trade. So I'm just trying to clarify kind of the ways that you can get in alignment with your strategy. Um, and yes, people operate differently. And you know, this entire this entire endeavor, I think people you know hear that this is a very personalized endeavor, but maybe it takes a long time for that to really sink in and become internalized in ways that they don't expect. Because I think it's really hard to express actually why that is so critical. I do think it's difficult to express. Certainly it's difficult to express in a tweet, that's for sure. But I think it takes a long time to, to really understand how personalized this, this endeavor is because it's centered so much on what you can tolerate, what, you, what, what works for you, you know? Like uh, some people are, are just built a certain way to take a certain amount of risk, right? And some people are not. And those, you know, that's, that's just one way that this is so personalized. Um, but yes, you, very much so. This is, it. this is individualized, not trying to prescribe. Swing trading is better than position trading by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so those are all great points. Um, so next slide, um, you know, question to think of just a kind of a thought, uh, to enter into your process. Are you consciously or subconsciously expecting most of your trades to run for months and all be huge winners? And this is something I see a lot of new traders do. They will call themselves swing traders, but they will actually be sitting there expecting whether subconsciously or, 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 you know, consciously expecting these names to really run and what they become deficient in is taking gains, taking, taking some uh, money off the table while a, a, a name is moving in the right direction, taking partials into strength, right? And this is just one example of how you can be misaligned. So I, I urge people to really try to identify if this is something going on, because I see it happen all the time. And as you said, the third, the, you made a, a couple, I think three really good points in, the, in your last comment. And the other one was about environment. And of course, all of this changes in environment. I would put environment above all else. Actually, Risk management is at the top of the pyramid, then environment, right? So environment is, you know, going to dictate, you know, how you're going to employ your different tactics as a swing trader and a, and a position trader. And that's a whole other, right, ball of wax, right? So I'm just talking about alignment here. Um, but most trades, and I think people will find this even in good environments, most trades do not result in these big high flyer, multi-month, high R multiple gains. So even if your goal is to position trade, I think you quickly become you know, aware of that fact that you're simply not going to hit on these big winners time after time after time. You know, they're going to be the ones that are out on the right side of your bell curve, of your trading uh, curve, and, and they're going to be the ones that make significant gains, but they're also not going to happen all that often, right? So one of the things to realize is that base hit trades can add up significantly over time, and taking partials is a very key uh, tactic in terms of treating your trading like a business. Um, so for me, the base hit trade, swing trading, it's where when you're in alignment with your swing trades, you understand that you're not trying to hold for months and months and months and months. And it becomes much more of a reflexive action to actually take partials into strength, understand where you may have a target, um, and actually, become, actually be able to take a decent amount of the trade off uh, before it starts to pull back. And I'm gonna talk, about, talk a little bit more in detail about that. Um, as we move forward here, next slide here, this is what I do. So I decide prior, prior to, or very shortly after, and I'll have examples of this. Um, if I'm going to be managing a trade as a swing and position trade, and you may, I know this differs from other people. I know some people have a completely different idea of this, but I actually try to decide prior to, um, or very shortly after I enter, whether or not I'm going to manage, uh, you know, a certain way or not. And that helps me keep myself mentally aligned and it avoids emotional trading. It avoids emotional trade management, which really ends up in being misaligned with what I'm trying to do, right? So the examples would be selling a position trade on every tick lower because I'm getting emotional about it, right? And I'm not following my, tra my trade management plan for a position trade because I didn't end up having an actual plan. So in my brain, I'm stuck somewhere in that middle ground between swing trade, position trade, this is gonna run out forever. Oh, I need to book my gains. Right? So you go through that kind of mental battle if you don't have a game plan ahead of time. And I know not everybody does it this way. This works for me, right? So I will decide prior to. And you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the a next add-on question would be, so how do you do that? And that's, that's kind of a whole separate discussion as well. But for me, I have certain criteria where a name will fit as a position trade and in a certain environment that makes sense. 
Um, and, and I'll go into how I kind of manage swings versus position trades. But the key here is that even before I enter the trade, most times I've decided whether or not I'm going to handle this as a position trade or a swing trade. So kind of on day one, I know how I'm, you know, how I'm going to manage this thing going forward. There's no deer in the headlights. There's no second guessing. You know, of course, it's never going to be managed perfectly, but I will take one track versus the other track, which to me, swing trade management versus position trade managements are very, very different tracks, right? And, and another thing, that, the kind of corollary to selling a position trade on every tick lower, you know, people that are in a position trade call themselves a position trader and are staring at a five-minute chart and getting very emotional over that five-minute chart, exiting a position for no no reason because they've become misaligned with their time frame. You know, that's the example I'm using. Uh, the corollary to that is thinking that every swing trade you enter is going to run out forever and you just hold on to it and refuse to book gains in a reasonable way and it inevitably comes back on you or you go through a big drawdown and you've suddenly had to pay a huge opportunity cost because you turned this swing trade that was supposed to last maybe a week or so into something that is much longer and you're weathering a drawdown through. So these are the kinds of, you know, examples that I see happen to people very, very frequently and certainly used to happen to me as well. So I, I make it a, a point to uh, decide ahead of time. And I think when I get into some chart examples, it'll become a little bit more clear what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I refer to it as a dance, right? Because to me, that's what this is. And, and I know that, you know, I know there's a lot of emphasis out there. People want to have a rule for everything. And I think that in the, in the beginning stages, that is, it's very helpful to have a set of rules so you can keep yourself honest and, and keep yourself on track. But I do think I refer to this as a dance because it really is a bit of an art. There's, there's no doubt there's an art to this. Um, and for me, that dance is with swing trades, I'm trying to sell most or all of my position before a meaningful pullback. I'm trying to catch a momentum move higher and get out before that name meaningfully pulls back. Uh, right? Nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. There's always going to be a pullback. And my job as a swing trader is to take care of that, uh, is to take advantage of that short burst in the direction of my trade and try to get out before that meaningful pullback. The exact opposite uh, for me in terms of position trading, the way I think about it is being able to, how, how much of that pullback can you withstand um, and keep your trade on, right? How much of a pullback can you withstand before it hits one of your stops or a raise stop, and, and then you can you can keep the name going in, the, in favor of the main trend, right? So it's very different in my point of view. So for swing trades, I'm trying to get most or all out in, in an area where I see it coming into resistance or a, a logical target area, or if you know that momentum move starts to wane before a meaningful pullback sits in, sets in, because the whole idea is to turn over quickly, you know, take advantage of a quick move and then move on to the next one. Whereas position trading is exactly the opposite. I want to buy at a time that, you know, it gives me the opportune entry that will pro likely be able to withhold or has the best chance of withholding a meaningful pullback without me getting stopped out. So that is the dance. And it's a radically different dance between the two of them, right? And that's, that's how I look at it. And that's why to me, it's so important to, uh, identify what strategy you're trying to you're trying to take hold of before you even enter the trade because um, you're going to get completely confused and second guess yourself and not really have a plan and have a tough time executing um, if you're just moving back and forth between those two different ideas so for me the everyone is different slide so this is entirely for me and this is how i i, I handle it um, but this is again kind of just going to highlight the the differences and how I think of them completely differently. So for me, I favor, I've always favored swing trades, but I've definitely come to recognize there's a very, very real value in holding position trades. Um, I will typically have 60 to 70%. Let's say my entire account, you know, is in the market right now. I'll typically have 60 to 70% swings. You know, this is an estimation, obviously. So the majority of my account will be in swings and let's say 30 to 40% is in position trades. So I'll have, Maybe mo maybe maximum I'll have three, maybe four position trades on honestly, um, at one time, and then the rest will be swing trades. So for me that became the mix because after years and years and years and years again of personalizing this, and this is all a personalized journey you arrive on. There's no way to prescribe this type of mix to somebody because it's this is entirely unique to me, right? It's not that somebody else out there might not have this same feeling. It's just that you have to figure it out for yourself. There's no way around that. You have to figure out what works for you and what sits well with you and what you can handle and what you can't handle. But for me, after years and years and years, I don't want to weather the drawdowns that are required of you. 
if you have your entire account in position trades, because there will inevitably be a drawdown. And let's say you're in, you know, the high flyers, the names that are really roaring, um, and the market corrects seven, eight percent. You might have a 25, 30 percent correction in those names that are the high flyers, right? And if you're all in on those position trades, you have to weather that. Um, and for me, that doesn't work. I, I just know that it does not work for me. It's not what I want to do. I do not want to sit through 30% drawdowns. Um, it's not It's not for me, right? I've tried it. It's, it's not for me. And it, there's only one way to find out is to try it, right? There's nobody that can tell you whether or not that's for you or not. Um, I also like the benefit of having the extra cash that comes back into your account when you're taking partials on swings as they get to your target um, and you're turning over your account. So I like to turn over my account in that way. Um, and swings do allow for that. Um, and so... The, that that moment where you're raising cash through selling into strength or you know the duration that you've expected has kind of hit the target you know you've been in a name for a week and maybe it hasn't gone anywhere um, or maybe you've reached your target and you've gotten out of of the name that immediately raises cash um, in your account again to deploy again right um, and the way i like i like to look at it is if i have a smaller amount of names in position trades then naturally as my swing trades are moving higher in in, in a, in a uh, conducive environment of course Naturally, as my swing trades are moving higher and I'm selling into strength, I've got more cash on hand to deploy or the biggest one is to have on hand as there's a pullback. So instead of weathering that 30% pullback in position trades, I like to have cash on hand so that I can execute during that pullback and try to get into other names and take advantage of that instead of um, having your entire account um, set into position trades that you're not going to exit. The entire plan is to not exit them for a while, right? And this is where everyone is completely different because everything I just said in relation to this slide is completely unique to me. You know, I'm sure there are other people who feel the same way just because there are millions of people in the world, right? And there are plenty of people trading. Um, but this is completely unique to me. And every person has to go through, you know, the endeavor of figuring out what works for them. But let's assume you are somebody who is a swing trade and a position trade, uh, you know, somebody that favors those time frames you are going to have to come to terms with this at some point, right? You are going to have to make decisions about how much of your account you want in swing trades, how much of your account you want in position trades. It doesn't have to be an exact science, but you will have to determine, yeah, you know, if you can weather those big drawdowns that are associated with uh, position trades. Um, and also if you can weather, you know, the kind of, the kind of fast uh, executions that are required for swing trading as well. So it's a, it's a very, you know, there's so much that goes into this um, and there's so many different tangents we could go on, but I just wanted to focus on the, the big differences between trade management swings and positions. And honestly, the biggest point I'm trying to make here is that uh, for me, one of the things that really got me over some of my problem spots years and years and years ago was this uh, simple way of deciding ahead of time, here's how I'm going to treat this. So that's kind of what I'm focusing on. Yeah. And I'd, I'd kind of say I may be the inverse of you, or maybe closer to 50 50. So that that's kind of my sweet spot. But it depends a little bit on, uh, you know, we talked about environment is above all else except risk management. It, it depends a little bit for me, you know, is stuff following through is stuff actually trending, and then I might favor a little bit more of the position trading. But, you know, I, I think for the most part, it's about 50 50 looking, looking at my style. I yeah, let's say that this slide is, is uh, and I probably should have indicated this. Let's say this slide is in a very strong uptrending yep. market. Um, yep. And, you know, we're, we're on a run where we've got, you know, all the ingredients you want for swing and position trading, follow through, you know, support, you know, yep. not the crazy intraday volatility, all the stuff that you want to identify as, as conducive to your, your style of trading. Let's say that's what this is for, right? So let's assume I'm 100% in the market. This is kind of where I would end up in like in, in a market that is just trending higher, right? It's, it's kind of where I am right now, to be totally honest with you. Um, in a market like 2022, uh, zero position trades. I don't position trade to the short side, so absolutely zero. And swing trades, you know, were lightning fast, um, in and out, taking ma massive partials at 1R, things like that, you know? So those are the tactics that we'll always adopt, adapt, excuse me, um, it, to the environment, right? That's, that's always the way it's gonna be. and. You know, you could talk, we could talk for a long time about adapting those tactics, but in general, you know, assuming that the environment is conducive to your, to your style, this is, this is where I'd end up maximum. I'm never, I'm never going to go to a point where I'm, 
you know, all of my trades are position trades is what I'm, you know, is basically the takeaway here. Uh, some people will, right? But I, again, I think that the only way you find out for yourself is trying it. It really is the only way you can find out for yourself. So that's why, you know, if you sign up for a course or a service or anything like that, read books, you, you can get tons of information, valuable information that can, uh, that can reduce your, you know, your learning curve, but you're just, you're never going to know until you're right up against, you know, that risk that you're facing and, and, and you understand that feeling of, you know, in, in a couple days, you can see a lot of your unrealized gains, you know, completely evaporate because you're holding on to names for the long term, right? Or, or holding on to quote unquote for the long term. Um, and it's a very different way of operating versus versus taking taking money off the table, turning over your account, right? There are, are you know, each one of them is difficult. Each one of them is extremely difficult, right? But you, you, the only way that you understand what you're built for, let's say, what your psychology is built for, is to is to get in there, right? It's the, it's the typical thing, like, you know, if your friend was standing on a uh, the train tracks, are you gonna are you gonna jump in there and and get him out of the way before that train comes? You don't know. You don't know until that moment hits you, right? None of us knows. Um, and I, I think there's some real life experience that you, you need to be like, you need to be, you know, in the ring with your, you know, bare knuckles to figure out what works for you. Right. And I think this comes with time. Yeah. How long did it take for you to kind of figure out that kind of sweet spot for yourself? I think I struggled with this for a long time, honestly, because I, I, I don't think I even identified it. I don't think I identified it for a long time because I think I, I, I didn't think of having that plan initially. I think I thought of it as. I'm going to see what the market shows me and I'm going to, I'm going to go with it. Like I have an understanding of how I want to manage trades, but I'm going to see what the market's giving me and, and I'm going to go with it. And that got me into a lot of confused spots, honestly. So I think I'm, it was a major, it was a major move in the right direction when I, when I settled on really treating these completely differently. And this was, this was quite a long time ago. Um, but I don't think I've ever, uh, you know, this isn't a topic I've really covered in any kind of public forum. This is a, it's, it's a webinar I've done on my site, but it's not, it's not something I've really put out there. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's, I think it's interesting. And, and I think that, you know, everybody operates differently, obviously. Um, and there will be people that say, well, I would never decide ahead of time. That makes no sense to me. Right. But for me, it makes a lot of sense to decide ahead of time because then it's just, it's, it's, it's not up for debate. You know, and the market is going to give me what it's going to give me, but I'm going to follow my plan, which is all I have control over. Right. And, and when we get into some of these charts, you know, we'll see there's going to be different there's going to be different trades where, you know, in hindsight, you could be like, well, obviously you should have position trade that one or, you know, obviously that should have been a swing trade. Right. But the point is, we don't know. We don't know which direct which end result is going to happen. All I can hang my hat on is how I'm going to manage it. And with me going in at the starting gun, knowing how I'm going to manage it has really helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the things in working with some new traders, I feel like it really helps them clarify what they're, what they're trying to accomplish. And there are some aha moments that I see people, you know, kind of encounter because they've been subconsciously, even if they don't even realize it, they've been doing things like I mentioned, like every swing trade they enter, they'll call themselves a swing trader, but then that little axiom they hear from everybody with a megaphone, let your winners run, gets in there and they don't want to let go. They don't ever want to let go, right? Taking partials is really hard. It's a really hard thing for some new traders to do is, is what I've seen. Um, all right, I, I know I'm babbling all over you, but I'm gonna, I'm no, gonna it's good. trudge forward. All right, so then I'm just gonna go into kind of nitty gritty of swing trading versus position trading. Then I'll talk about some charts here. Um, so the way I think about swing trading is you're catching medium term swings in price. I mean, people talk about price swings for a reason. That's where the name came from, right? My, my idea, and I think everybody's idea that is swing trading is to compound your account quickly and you have basically a high turnover, meaning your money is moving from trade to trade. You're not sitting in it. You're, you're, you're uh, turning over your account. So for me, and this is extremely market dependent, I view uh, swing trades as one day to a couple weeks, right? In 2022, I think my average swing trade duration was one day. Um, so it, like you effectively became a day trader, even though I wasn't operating on, uh, intraday charts at all. I mean, I'd be lightning quick. If, if I could hold the name overnight, you know, that was a, that was a swing trade, right? Just one night defined it as a swing trade. Right. And then in a market like we're in right now, I have swing trades that have been running for three, four weeks, right? A little partial that's running, um, that starts to get into that position trade territory. And that's, as you mentioned, a huge reflection of how important the environment is because you need to adapt to that and respond to that. Um, and you can change your tactics accordingly, right? And it, and it gives you really strong feedback to know, hey, this is, a, this is a point where I can begin position trading again. You know, we've been in that environment for a while, uh, but certainly a, a, an environment like 2022, or I'd even say a good chunk of 2023, 
for me, it was not a position trading environment. But here's where we get to time frame duration and expectation. So for swing trades for me, my time frame, my signal is coming on the daily charts. I'm not somebody that gets into the five minute charts. Um, I know people do that. Obviously, plenty of people do that. I don't do that. And I can tell you through experience, you can fully operate without getting into the five minute charts and you can have some really good uh, results without getting into five minute charts. For me, the signal is on the daily charts. Um, and that is a big change from what, you know, what I'll, I'll say about position trading, which for me, the signal comes from the weekly charts and expectations. It's a big range, right? But for me, the ideal swing trade is about three to five R. Um, now without getting into entry tactics and being too specific about that, I like to take logical entries opportunity of where the opportunity arises where I can have a two to 4% stop. I, re I really try to favor, you know, closer to 2%, honestly, especially on swing trades, because the whole idea is to take advantage of a burst of momentum in the right direction. So ideally I like to be out of the trade with a net of three to five R. Um, on swing trades. And this is where, you know, realistic expectations begins to come in and environment plays such a crucial role because in 2022, one and a half hour, two hour maybe. Um, and I, I had to do a lot of adjusting to, to make the trading math make sense and be profitable. Um, and recently, you know, and I'll show you some, some swing trades that went out to 11 R, right? So the environment plays a massive difference, but this is where your expectation. And I've seen so many people um, you know, we'll enter a swing trade and they'll get just very, very kind of deer in the headlights because uh, they're expecting it to run on and run on and be, be you know, a winner that moves 50%, 75% in short order, right? Um, and the duration uh, is always going to be in conflict with that expectation, that realistic expectation, because for swing trades, you're just not going to, look, I shouldn't say you're never going to get moves because, you know, what do we just see SMCI 100% in 11 days, something like that. So it can happen, Right. Most of the time, you're not going to see a hundred percent move in five trading sessions. Most of the time, right? Um, so that's the trade alignment for uh, swing trades uh, in terms of the time frame, daily charts for me, duration, roughly one day to two weeks, depending entirely on the environment. Um, and then expectations for me is generally going to be in that range, three to five R. I'm happy with that range. So, for instance, if I see, and I'm going to show you a chart that that absolutely ran like, you know, like a biotech on me. Um, and I, I cashed a lot out before it reached the, the apex, right? And for me, I'm fine with that because if I, can, if I can make a certain amount in short order, then that is absolutely like the pinnacle of success in swing trading because the whole idea is to be in this name for a short duration of time and, and hit a reasonable R multiple and just do it over and over and over. So that's being in alignment. Um, and this will probably all make much more sense once I get to the charts, but there's just general idea. Um, so taking partials, uh, for swing trading to me. And there's a lot of overlap here with position trading. Uh, but again, I'll just, I'll just reiterate that. I think this is, this is probably the cornerstone of the, you know, once you get past risk management, this is probably like the cornerstone of treating your trading like a business in my view, meaning you are, you are now actually serious about paying yourself. You're not treating it like a hobby or a casino where you're just trying to see how far something can go or trying to be super aggressive and hoping for the best. Right? I think taking partials um, into strength is, is, is when you can begin to turn the corner into being a much more serious-minded trader and remembering to pay yourself. Um, and it comes with remembering to turn over your, that you are turning over your account with swing trading, and that involves taking partials into strength. So the first partial for me, and this is for me, of course, um, is always between 1 and 1.5R, depending on the environment. And this is where tactics change, right? So in the 2022 environment, I might have taken half off at one R because so many names would make a small move up and reverse. Um, it was a grind. It was like a street fight, right? You know, especially on the long side, right? But even on the short side, that, that can be the case. Uh, but on the long side in a year like 2022, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a straight up street fight um, if, you're taking, if you're taking trades to the long side. So to make your trading math work, you've got to be much more aggressive in, your, in taking partials. Now, in an environment like this, I try to let it go. Let, it, let a name go. Like, and, and in... Uh, 2022, I, th I think I said that uh, I would take maybe half off, at least a third off, right? Uh, now, you know, I'll try to let it stretch to one and a half hour, maybe even two hour, depending on how, how far things are really running. And I'll take maybe a quarter off, maybe even a little bit less, right? So those are the, the ways that you change your tactics according to the environment. And that develops over time with feel and understanding your environment. But the general idea is I'm taking some off between one and 1 1.5 hour. And I do that for swing trades, position trades, because there's going to be a huge amount of trades that just come right back on me. They can be the best textbook setup that you want to frame um, and, and have a webinar about. 
and they can still reverse on you and not one of us knows which the end result is going to be right so i've had enough experience with letting trades come back in on me that a long time ago i adopted this basic policy and this is really the like my only hard and fast rule in, in terms of sell rules is that I pay myself a little bit when this when it starts moving. Um, it will obviously decrease my potential for you know a massive run, but it also keeps my equity curve smoother. Um, and for me, if I take a partial off, that's the only way psychologically that I can actually let a name run to twenty thirty R is having that partial in the bank because otherwise I'm just going to be you know seeing my P and L bounce around like a ping pong ball with this huge position on. Um, and not be able to psychologically handle it. And that's, again, something that everybody has to come to terms with. And for me, I raise my stop to, to break even after the first partial, and I just protect it, protect it right there. If it, it stop, if a name stops me out of break even, I can always re-enter, right? But I just protect those gains because for me, I think one of the biggest uh, psychological killers of confidence is letting a winner turn into a loser. I think it's far worse than just taking a loss straight away. I think it's far, far worse to actually mismanage a trade so badly that you let a decent win turn into a loss. So that is something, again, a long time ago, uh, instituted that you know aggressive protection of break-even. And then I'll just continue raising stops to logical levels, usually previous days low or a meaningful days low or a moving average, what have you. But I'll try to be out of the bulk of the position at or near a target, and a target is, it, is, it, is an art. <laughs> target is an art, it is not a science. And we'll get into this um, you know, when I get into the charts really quickly. And, you know, strong trending market like we're in right now, that's when I'll let a partial run. So I will let a, you know, let's say a quarter run of the swing trade. So it becomes this semi hybrid of a position trade at the very end where you just let a partial run. But the bulk of the trade has been treated like a swing trade. And then position trading in, in you know, contrast to that, you're trying to catch a medium to long-term price trend. It's a completely different goal. It's a completely different uh, expectation, right? And this will require sitting through pullbacks. There's no way to hold a name for three, six months without sitting through pullbacks, as we all know. It's not possible. Nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. And frequently, you know, if you want to hold past three months, you're going to sit through an earnings report, right? And you have to have enough cushion there. So it's, it's a completely different ballgame. This is that dance where you need to have that, uh, entry level be um, opportune enough so that you can you can weather the deeper pullbacks um, and ideally build up a de decent cushion to weather earnings reports, right? It's a completely different uh, mindset for me. And here's where my focus is going to be on the weekly charts. So my time frame is going to be the weekly charts. That's where I'm going to look for a signal for a position trade. I will. There will definitely be times where I'll take a swing trade in a name where the weekly chart looks extended, for instance, because I see a, an opportunity for a short-term burst. But it's not something, it, 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 and it can come from extended names, as we all know. Like, you know, we, what's extended right now? Just like everything that's, that's leading, right? And they keep going higher, right? So you can take quick swings in those names. But for, for me, for a position trade, I am definitely looking for a weekly chart setup. So I will take swing trades with a weekly chart that does not uh, have a setup. But I will never take a position trade on a weekly chart that does not have a setup. Um, and this, it also requires some knowledge of fundamentals. And as you know, definitely Richard, I'm not a fundamental guy. Um, f f my take on it is over 10 years, over 20 years, fundamentals are the, are the driver. That's not the time frame I'm operating on, right? Especially yeah. with swings, especially with swings. If I'm talking one to two weeks, very rarely are fundamentals, the driver it's relative strength theme momentum is the driver in those, right? Um, it frequently fundamentals will be absolutely disregarded in terms of that momentum. Um, so that's not what I'm looking at for swing trades for position trades, fundamentals by the, uh, by the sheer fact that you're likely going to sit through earnings reports. I've got to pay attention to that. Right. And that's like a whole different set of criteria, but basically you just, I just want to do what I call, you know, like uh, a skimming of the fundamentals and make sure, you know, we're on a boat, boat with no holes in it and things are looking, looking, looking like they're moving in the right direction. Right. So, um, I, I like to have the knowledge of some, some fundamentals, but again, I'm not going to hold for 10 years, 20 years. Um, you know, names like Apple, Amazon, that's where fundamentals went out, right? That that's what, that's where the fundamentals are. The entire driver of the stock is on that time frame. Um, so for me, uh, position trades will last anywhere from one week to many months and even up to a year plus depending on the market condition. Right. And, and in some markets, I simply won't position trade at all. And the, this is where the larger R multiple returns are possible because I'm always going to get out of dodge on swings when they give me, when they give me a, a decent enough return in short order. I'm going to get out of dodge, but obviously on position trades, you know this is where you can get up to 20, 30, you know, 
you, you know, the, the, uh, the sky's your limit, right? Uh, but I do believe that these come with a big opportunity cost because you're going to be sitting in a name for a very, very, very long time. And the ones that don't work can keep your money tied up for a very long time before they prove to you that they have not worked, right? So that is one thing that I think everyone needs to balance as well. Yeah, there's opportunity costs. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, that's, an, that's another thing that's just a personalized thing. Like, um, I like, th there's a part of me very much that loves the kind of immediate feedback with, with swing trading. Um, mm -hmm. Day trading is too much for me. Like, I don't want five minute time frame feedback. Uh, but I like that I can get feedback. You know, the, I think the best losses for swing trades for me are the ones that just right away go the opposite way and I cut them. <laughs> Those are the best, right? Because you're just done, move on, right? Um, but usually if a swing trade is not going to work, it'll take two, three days and it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell you it's not going to work. A position trade could take weeks to really tell you it's not going to work. So that's where the opportunity cost comes in. Um, I think this is my last slide before I get to examples. Um, so for position trading, again, taking partials is super important. I do it for every trade. This is one of the, this is one of the questions I get constantly. So that's why I have that on here because people will, will ask me. So for position trades, do you take partials as well? Yes, I absolutely take partials. Uh, for me, it's just paying myself. Once I get up to one to 1 1.5 R, I'm paying myself. How much um, and how far out I let that go is, is you know, up for debate. And that's a judgment call based on the environment you're in and you train your tactics. Uh, but for me, even with, with position trades, I'm taking partials. Like I'm going to show you an Nvidia trade. I took a partial, a one to one point five R. You know, it, probably everybody you, you you've talked to is in Nvidia right now, right? It's 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 the stock, and you know we could have an argument of, you know, my goodness, why'd you take a why'd you take a partial that early? And for me, my answer is based on the twenty years of experience that I have in my psychology, um, that you absolutely never know, even in a name like Nvidia that was breaking out of a monster base and is arguably your your leading stock, right? I've seen. I've seen my fair share, as we all have, of the uh, absolute reversals and pile drivers. And I like to pay myself. And then that, that initial payment to myself is what psychologically allows me to hold on to it for what it's doing now. Um, and that's the way I work, right? But everybody needs to confront this themselves. But my, my overall point here is not to just talk about what I do, but even though you know, there's almost no way to talk about what's meaningful unless you talk about what you do personally. Um, but hopefully the message that's getting across here is just being in alignment with the way these different things are managed. And I think when I get into the charts, that'll be a little bit more clear. So the, the idea with position trades is to let the trade run. This is where the let your winners run can come in, but you have to be very, very selective, I think. Um, and the environment is absolutely got to be at your back um, if you're gonna take position trades because you, you can't let winners run in an environment where nothing's running. It's as simple as that. Right. But so many people try to force it to happen. I mean, in 2022, you just saw so many new traders trying to cling on to that hope of everything's going to run and nothing was running, you know, and they just get chopped up to pieces. Um, so then, you know, the, the kind of usual standard way of managing, I'll let a key SMA move past my break even point. And that becomes a soft stop for me. Um, and for me, I'll probably use a filter of like 1% around that uh, moving average. And it does become a little bit of a judgment call. And I'll show you an example of how I, in hindsight, totally mismanaged an AMD partial um, based on this. But a meaningful close below a key SMA is when I'll, I'll uh, close out that position. That's my, that becomes my soft stop. Um, so that's, that's how I basically raise stops is letting that key SMA be kind of the trailing stop that rises up and keeps me safe. I always have a hard stop too, just in case, you know, something absolutely you know, crazy happens in the market and things, there's like a flash crash. I always have a hard stop lower than that that will just take me out. Um, and I'm not one that adds a lot, honestly, but you can add, obviously I, I would, you know, myself add occasionally, but I've got to be in within a certain range of when I first entered. Um, otherwise, if I see a name setting up again, for instance, AMD in my view is potentially setting up again and I'm in this as a, as a position trade, but it's so far from where my initial entry was that I would not consider that adding. For me, I would just consider that a new trade, right? That's how I look at it. So that just has its own rules. That's the way it is. I would even sell and take partials on the, the lots that I've bought, you know, differently, right? In terms of for tax purposes and stuff like that, right? Um, and then, you know, the only other kind of guideline I have is take some off on in a common sense, kind of high volume, high range up day, you know, possible blow off top, which you never know uh, it happening in real time, but it makes sense. When you start to feel really greedy, take some off, right? So I'm not somebody that has all these kind of algorithmic rules of like, you know, once it's 14.378% above, 
the, the uh, nine day moving averages, I've got to, I've got to take it off. Right. I, so I'm, I like to employ common sense and just kind of find these, follow these general guidelines and you're never going to sell perfectly. You're never, you know, you're going to sell too soon or too late. That's the way it goes. Right. But you're trying to get the meat of the trend. So I think that is my last slide on this before I get into charts. Yes. Yeah. What, one thing maybe before we get into that, I, I just want to point out, uh, I, I think a key point that, uh, you know, one of the takeaways for me, some of these rules that you've kind of created for yourself, it, a lot of it is to address the mental side of trading where with that partial off that first partial off, you're more comfortable holding that stock for a bigger move or the last point here, taking some off the table when there's a high volume range up day, when the stock is maybe already extended, what that's going to do is on the remaining part of your position, it's going to have less of an impact, the higher volatility on your equity curve, your PL, all that, and gives you that comfort to sit for it a little bit more. So um, I don't know, it, it, that's just kind of a takeaway from from kind of, you know, what you've been saying that, that that's a key takeaway for me. Yeah, 100%. And I, th I think the purpose of rules, quite honestly, is, you know, some people look at the purpose of rules to somehow statistically maximize your returns, right? And, and, and I think that's a, it, it's one way of looking at it for sure. For me, uh, it's, it's a way of, of personalizing this to me so that I can operate the way I need to operate psychologically, right? And I think yeah. I, when I look on the rules that I have, first of all, the only rules that are like ever sacrosanct and written in stone are your risk management rules, like position sizing, you know, how much open risk I'm gonna have on at one time. Those are the only rules that just, you just cannot even have a discussion with, right? Rules like this, I mean, these are very fungible, right? The only, the only one that I'd say is, is, that I follow to a T is that, that initial partial. And again, that's tailored to me, right? I, I, I'm sure I could, uh, I could show you many trades where my actual end result would have theoretically been much better had I not taken that partial. But at the same time, I probably would have managed the trade entirely differently and possibly made some serious trade management mistakes if, I, if it wasn't right for me psychologically, right? And this goes right. back to what you were talking about in the beginning. Everyone's different. And that's why, you know, everyone needs to figure out what, what rules work for them. It's just so personalized, right? So I think that's a, a fantastic point because uh, a lot of, you know, the very beginning traders, I think, you know, will ingest a lot of rules from somebody else and think that's the secret formula. This is the way to do it. Um, and they're going to run up against a brick wall because they're not that person, right? And then they don't know how they're going to behave and, and how that's going to work. And, and f also, there are no uh, secret rules that perform all the time in the best environment or in any environment um, that gives you the best outcome at all times, as we know, right? And even when you are a system trader that literally tries to make those rules, that system will go in and out of fashion based on the environment. So uh, my point is, yes, personalization, big time. You know, these are personalized to me. And that's what, that's kind of the journey that everybody needs to be on. If they're going to take trading seriously, you have to figure out what works and doesn't work for you and how to make that part of your process. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, let's dive into some, some of the real trades because I think that always helps everybody kind of put everything together. All right, so now let me couch this before we start off here. Um, by saying, uh, in 20, let's see, 2023, I keep getting my ears screwed up. 2023 was last year. <laughs> I had a 47% win rate, right? So 53% of the time I either had a break even or a loser, right? So that is where I'm at. Uh, more than half the time I'm going to, I'm going to take a loss, right? So the, the, by no means does every trade look like what I'm about to show you by any stretch of the imagination. That is not reality. I am very big into reality as, as many of, as those of you that follow me closely, I love to give big, strong doses of reality to people and kind of be not the wet blanket, but somebody that can actually ground your feet <laughs> on the planet yeah. earth um, and let you operate in the real world. Right? So th by no means are these trades meant to be something that shows you, um, you know, something that it's not, which is these are winners. These are selected winners, right? I'll show you a couple losers, but these are going to be uh, to, to show trade management. I have to show something that actually worked, right? Otherwise it's just a quick stop out. So um, I just wanted to couch it with some reality there. So, uh, Mongo database. Um, so my entry, let's get this thing going on was over here. So this is entry in my stop. I usually have a two to three, 4% kind of stop. This one's pretty tight and this moved on a day where uh, data dog was gapping up. So this was, this is what I'd call an opportunistic trade, right? It's not an if X then Y trade, meaning you've got a specific trigger. Um, and all I have to do is move there. You could set a buy stop limit order, et cetera. That's if X, then Y trading, right? And we could go into 
we could go into a whole subset of this, but this for me is an opportunistic. I'm just spotting an opportunity in a name that I've been following, right? So this moved up. I'm not going to talk about each entry because that's a whole separate world, but uh, this moved up uh, in sympathy with Datadog, uh, gapped up on the 50 day. I, I took an opportune entry right here, right? And for me, this was a swing trade. Now, a lot goes into the environment at the time. This was the beginning of November, right? We had that turn in the market um, back in, as, as I'm sure you guys remember, end of November, end of October into November, right? Um, uh, so this was right around that time where I was still pretty skeptical, right? And, and uh, so right off the bat, this is a swing trade with me, entered right here, um, took my usual partial right around here. I think it was the first day, actually. Paid myself a little bit on the first day, right? That's my partial. Then it keeps moving in the direction of the trade, which is what you want to see. No harm, no foul, no meaningful pullback here. And I took another partial um, as I start to get into some obvious resistance, right? So just some common sense ideas here. And I don't have all of this mapped out. I'd have to go back and look through my entire brokerage account. Um, I do post these entries on, on uh, my service um, from, the, from my brokerage account to, to have some transparency, even though it's, it's not an alert service. Um, but I, you know, I, don't, I didn't go back and map out every, uh, every partial I took here. But the, the overall picture was I was largely out of this trade by the time it got into this target. Because for me, the targets, there's, there's obvious targets. And there's a, there's, it's, it's an art, right? But here's a very obvious target staring in the face, a previous swing high, right? That's, that's my expectation. So my, my time signal here, my time frame is the daily chart. I'm taking this on a daily chart. I did not go into the five minute chart and, and try to massage this. This was just a daily chart entry as a name moves above a downtrend line, reclaims some key moving averages, gives me a really tight area to have an opportune entry. Um, then the duration, I'm expecting a couple days to a couple weeks. That's what I'm expecting. And then my target is here. That's my expectation. I'm not expecting this to triple, quadruple, or do any of that. This is a swing trade managed from the beginning. So I take my partial, I believe it was on the first day. Um, and I think I was actually still being fairly aggressive because again, this, this, the market had not proven itself that it was going to take off the way that it had. Um, and then I, I believe I took another partial somewhere in, you know, somewhere in this area. Then I was actually making my daily video um, uh, on my service and this was gapping up after hours with, uh, again, I think in sympathy with Datadog. Um, and I took my partial right there because it met my, I closed it out right there because it met my target. So that's again, me just operating in alignment with what I was trying to achieve. Hit my target, I'm out. You know, could it have gapped up the next day and roared higher? A hundred percent it could have, right? But all I'm doing is trying to take what, what comes my way in a market environment um, and res in a market environment that I'm, I'm reading as one that is not favorable for position trading at the moment. Turns out, you know, in November, I could have been more aggressive if I, you know, with the hindsight knowledge. But at this moment in time, I'm taking a swing trade. And because I had that plan in place um, from the beginning, when I saw this gap up after hours, you know, it was a no-brainer decision. I'm taking that, I'm taking the opportunity to sell into that gap up and I actually sold uh, post-market um, and took that trade off. Now, the fact that it reversed is by no means, you know, some sort of claim that I have a crystal ball or anything like that. This is one possible outcome. I'm going to show you others that kept going, right? So, but this did reverse. And I think it's a good example of being in alignment because if I had, if I had planned this to be a position trade per my rules, I'd have been out here, um, you know, and this would have been a, a, a different type of trade, right? But this gives me the clarity going into it uh, that I knew even when I saw, I think that the thing that I remember most about this is when I saw it gapping up after hours, it's at my target, book it, take it. That's what I was thinking. So that to me is being in alignment with your style, with your, with your trade plan. And one quick question before uh, PLTR, are you sizing your position versus swing trades the same? Or is it, you know, always dependent on, you know, the, where you can put your stop loss, you know, for that particular uh, trade, that particular setup? Yeah, so I size just based on the, the entry to the stop. Um, and I will have, you know, different risk tiers, like 25 basis points in a choppy environment or when I'm being conservative. Um, and 50 basis points is my standard size when I want to, you know, uh, what I would consider a full size trade. Occasionally, I'll go higher than that, but really rarely. I'd say my sweet spot is 50 basis points. Um, and yes, they'll be, it's the same sizing. So like if we're in a choppy environment, if we're in a choppy environment, I'm probably not taking position trades. But let's say that there is one. I would still size it the way I'd size a swing trade. Gotcha. Um, all right. So PLTR. So we know what happened here. Uh, I was not in this. Uh, so we know what happened here. This was my entry back here. Um, 
so this again was back in November, kind of like the, the market showing signs that it was going to uh, reverse and move higher. But again, I, I looked at this as a swing trade. I looked at this pulling back, nice little bull flag, uh, holding a recent swing high, et cetera, et cetera, coming back into the nine day. We talk about entry some other time. In any case, I entered here, tight, tight stop the way I usually do. Nice move higher. Pretty sure I took a partial on that first day because that's the way I operate, right? Um, then this started to move higher. And my thinking here is, you know, this move past a horizontal pivot breakout level, I've seen so many of these reverse. And this was already out to, I believe, five or six R. Um, so I did take another partial right around here. Uh, because again, this is aligning with my strategy. I was not thinking I'm holding this through this breakout and I'm trying to have this run. My target is really this general area, this breakout level, right? Which still gives me a nice four or five R return because my stop was so tight, right? So this is just aligning with my strategy at the time, not turning this into a position trade. This was in my brain, a swing trade. So I did, I remember taking a partial off here. Then my remainder I had on a stop on the low of this day. So I was taken out the next day as this moved lower. Um, which is what I'll do is I'll just raise stop. So the next day, this looked like it was going to keep going, not so fast and returned. And again, this is not to, to pretend as if I had some understanding of that, that, that happening. This is to highlight that in my brain, you know, I had gotten what I got, what I wanted out of this trade, what I was expecting out of this trade already and took the gains, right? There will be others that I show you that keep going, right? But this in my brain is being aligned with my trade and not sitting here thinking, well, you know, this has moved so nicely. This is, this is going to move to, this is probably going to double in short order. I'm just going to hold on to it and let it, this all come back in. Right. Because, and if I had been position trading this, I'd have been out here, you know, closer to break even. So it's just a vast difference between, uh, managing swing trades and position trading. And not once in my brain was I thinking I'm going to hold this, you know, I'm going to hold this and let the 20 day be my soft stop. My idea was I got to get out of Dodge here before a meaningful pullback. That's why I would take a partial here and then I have a stop below this day's low and get me out of Dodge. And that was a nice five, six R swing trade. I think the net having taken the partial is, is closer to three R, closer to three and a half R, four R, something like that. Um, and then here's an example. Am I, am I babbling too much, Richard? Or should I keep going? No, this is good. This is good. All right. So here's an example of one that, that uh, you know, keeps going, right? Uh, so this is TPX, not exactly a sexy stock. I don't think anybody would be uh, all excited about this one. But this, again, back to November, but starting to be a point where in the market where things were starting to move nicely. Uh, this is one, a name I'd had success with a long time ago, so it was on my radar. A nice little inside day here, right on key moving averages, something I'm always looking for. Uh, entry and stop right here, nice and tight. And there's launch pad, right? And I'm looking at this as a swing trade. So here's one that surpasses expectations. It starts to give me some different feedback. So I definitely took a partial off on day one, because to me, that's a gift, right? If you have day one like that, that's a gift. Take a partial. Now I can psychologically settle into it. I'm de-risked. Let's see what this gives you, right? Um, so the way I operate, I'm sure I took a partial right around here. And then I even took another partial right up here at the target. Um, and then all I did was leave a tiny amount on, I think less than a quarter. Um, and this did move higher, right? Would I have benefited from holding a much larger position this whole way? Because this eventually ran out to 11R, 12R. Um, so my, my trade actually closed out was a net of about 5R. So this is still me just following my alignment and that I'm out of most of the trade as it comes into the target. Um, and before it, a meaningful pullback, this happened to be just, you know, spectacular, right? This, they, do, they don't always work like this, right? By any stretch of the imagination, especially in a name like TPX, you don't expect it to move like this. Uh, but there we have it, right? Um, so this started to show the strength in the market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can adjust your tactics. But my point on this one is I'm still following my, my swing trading alignment. I'm not saying, hey, this is moving real well. I'm just going to use the 20-day as a guide, which I know, you know, I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm just saying what I do and it helps me keep things clear. I didn't suddenly change and say, all right, I'm going to turn this into a position trade when it's up here. And let's look at what would have happened if I did. I'd have just been cut out over here, right? After sitting in it for another two and a half weeks. For me, when you get handed something like this and it's a swing trade to begin with, of course, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that. And that is, I believe, one of the, one of the, uh, you know, the things that gets a lot of people over the hump of tra taking their trading a lot more seriously is, is paying yourself and knowing when to, uh, you know, not push too hard. Meaning, uh, if I get a, a swing trade that gives me this kind of return, this is, this is still up around seven and eight R ish. Um, if I get a swing trade that gives me that kind of return in short order, I'm taking those gains. I'm not going to sit there and let it and, and pretend like it's going to run out to the moon, right? Because nothing goes straight up. Nothing goes straight down. You're kind of asking the market for a favor, right? So I had taken the bulk of the trade off. 
this is where I started to let some things, you know, let a little partial go on a swing trade. Um, and that's what happened here um, and took it off. I think I took it off somewhere over here because it just started to feel ridiculous to me. So I took this off. Um, and then it's been basing out ever since then, right? I actually reported earnings today and had that kind of pile driver look on it. Uh, but that this is an example of a name that, you know, the environment's starting to change a little bit and, and you could let a little little runner move, but still I'm treating this as a swing trade. And I knew that going into it. This happens to just be one that is an absolute, you know, beautiful result. Um, they certainly don't all move like that. But in my brain, still a swing trade. I didn't get to this point and say, I'm going to turn it into a position trade and manage it differently. Yeah, those mattress companies, they can really take off. Yeah. <laughs> Right. TPX is not you're not going to find people like uh, throwing that all over the place on on Twitter. Right. But you can get moves yeah. like that. You can get moves yep. like that in unexpected places. Um, and here's spot. Here's here's a, here's one later in the, uh, you know, the cycle we're in right now. Right. I was taking some looking at some examples back here in November. Here's where things started to really look as if they were going to move nicely. Um, and you get start to have a little bit more conviction. And again, this was a swing trade for me. Right. So this is where people can start to say, hey, you know, you left some on the table here and I'm going to argue I'm still doing exactly what, what I'm doing, right? So this is, this is where I entered right here. Let's get that arrow where it should be. Um, typical thing for me, kind of descending wedge, nice orderly downtrend line right into key moving averages, kind of beautiful setup, right? Uh, this is the typical thing I'm looking for, right? So entered here, starts to move higher, definitely take my usual partial off, gets up to the, the target here, and this is around 5R-ish. Um, actually, let's, let's see what it was. Just out of curiosity, because I don't want to pretend like I remember everything. Um, but I'm just doing it graphically to take a look. Uh, three R, four R. So four R. Uh, I'm glad I checked myself. So four R ish around here, and I'm out of most of the trade right around this area. And then I left a little partial on. I had a stop at break even. I hadn't even raised it. So as luck would have it, I did not get stopped out almost to the penny here and let a partial move. But I then then took the partial off after another gap. So I was out of this trade before it kept moving. And for me, you know, some people may look back on that and be like, you left so much on the table. But for me, you know, the, the duration expectation, a couple of weeks, that's what I got, right? The R expectation, the return expectation, three to five R, that's exactly what I got on to the next, right? But this gives me feedback um, and helps me maybe build some conviction and, hey, this is an environment where I should take some position trades, right? So th that's the, the uh, value that I get out of that. But I'm just trying to show how I'm aligned with this the whole way, right? In hindsight, yeah, in hindsight, yeah, if I had declared to myself this is a position trade, this would still be on and it would be roaring. But that doesn't mean that this swing trade was not a success, right? I've had people come to me and ask questions like this and say, well, where did I go wrong? And if they explained a trade like that, I would say, you didn't go wrong anywhere. That's exactly what you were looking for. The trade behaved exactly as you planned. You handled it exactly the way you wanted to handle it. Successful swing trade, on to the next, right? So that's, that's kind of the point I'm trying to make here is that you keep yourself in a certain mindset a certain management style, the outcome is not within your control, right? So a trade like this, which looks very different than Mongo database, where it looks like I called the top, which I didn't, right? You know, the outcome will, will be completely out of your control. But for me, I think it's still very, very important to handle swing trades and position trades differently. And one does not, like a successful trade is not negated by the fact that it kept moving uh, because you're only getting paid for uh, between, between the point where you buy and you sell. Um, I've got a few more and then we'll be, we'll be wrapped up. Here's DraftKings. So having some of that information in hand, right? Now I'm more apt to let a partial run on swing trades. And here's one, the entry is here. And again, these are, you know, these are, these are trades that worked really well, right? This is not what every single trade I enter looks like, right? But these are kind of my wheelhouse in terms of entries. There was a period of time here where what I'm specifically looking for, and I'm not saying I'm the only one looking for them, but this was where like, when you get a period in time where like your bread and butter setups are, are appearing and they're, and they're working, it's, it's a nice time, right? And that's, what was, that's what's been going on lately. Uh, in any case, DraftKings coming back, uh, nice, real, nice, really nice wedge. I was watching this on the weekly time frame as well, actually. Um, but then breaking higher, entered here as I saw a, uh, uh, this name, this was actually a day where, I just remember this really clearly. This was actually green on a morning where bulk, the bulk of the tape was red. Uh, so I just took a shot here, um, thinking that it had held it had put potentially put in a new higher low above this recent low. So taking a shot here on an entry, um, tight stop as I usually do and moved higher, took a partial here, took more partials here, but let a little bit more run on the swing trade, right? But it's still a swing trade because I'm mostly out of the trade at the target. And this thing is now out to 18 R. Um, so that's, that's how I've you know, adjusted 
adjusted in terms of tactics from that first MDB trade where I just got all out to suddenly seeing the environment start to uh, improve. So I'll let, a little, I'll let a partial on a swing trade run, but it's still a swing trade where I, that, that dance I mentioned, I'm trying to get out before a meaningful pullback. This thing hasn't even had a meaningful pullback. Um, and this, you know, in hindsight, again, is one where you say like, well, you should have, you know, you should have put 50% of your account in this and, and made it a position trade, right? But to me, this is still a very, very successful swing trade, raised cash, got out at, you know, the bulk of this trade was out to 11 R that is, that is a massively successful swing trade in my view, massively successful. So take it, right? Take it. That's what the mindset uh, of taking a swing trade is. So my, my alignment in terms of time frame, my signal on the daily time frame, my duration, one to two ish weeks, uh, maybe three weeks. Um, and then my expectations, you know, this, this is exceeding my expectations. So happy to book that. Um, and then let a little partial run based on the feedback I've been recently getting. Um, anything you want to interject? Yeah, I've got a question, but uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Why not? Um, what goes into the decision of deciding whether it's going to be a swing or position trade for you? you I, it, it might be a little bit of feel, but uh, you mentioned you were watching this on the weekly as well. Right. So you, you've, you've got that overall setup. What made you decide to take this as a swing trade instead of right. trying to look for a bigger move? This is this is where there's you know judgment and where it turns into gray area. So I don't like to take super volatile names uh, as position trades uh, for, you know, a lot of the reasons I alluded to earlier is I don't like to sit through massive drawdowns. I don't like the uh, roller coaster that goes with it. I know some people that's their main focus, right? Because there can be huge gains made for me. That doesn't work. I don't sit well in hyper volatile names. I'm not saying DraftKings is one, but I definitely look for targets that are a little bit less volatile. Um, and mm -hmm. one's coming up like Nvidia and AMD. But it, a good question you raised because on the weekly chart, this is why I was watching this. Yeah. Um, this was, you know, this was screaming at me this entire time. And I don't know if you remember, but there were people wildly in favor of DraftKings during this phase. Mm -hmm. Then it just absolutely fell off the radar, it seemed. At least, you know, if you mm -hmm. go by anything on, on, you know, Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, right? Which mm -hmm. I don't tend to go by, but it is a, it's at least a decent window into names that people are watching. And this just absolutely was on no one's radar, but made this really nice orderly move back down to the 200 week moving average and the rising 30 week moving average was getting tight. I mean, it just looked like a phenomenal setup on the weekly chart, which is something, a criteria for me to take a position trade. I simply made a judgment call that I didn't want to position trade DraftKings at this point, right? Uh, and that's me making a judgment call. And I saw earnings out here, you know, within about a month. So for me, it was a swing trade. Um, and, and because of the fact that it had been showing some relative weakness, actually, honestly, um, at, at, during the time, because a lot of names were running and this one was not, and that this was pulling back. Those were my factors, right? Everybody's gonna have their own different mm -hmm. factors. Um, but this was setting up nicely on the weekly chart. But again, I'm taking this on a daily chart. This is, this is a, 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 as textbook a wedge as you're ever gonna get. And you know, one of the keys here to go a little bit off topic is when, when I start to see this new low, yeah. Uh, you know, be a little bit higher than this previous one that could be turned in the corner, right? So that's, that's what got me uh, really interested in it on the daily chart. Um, and then you flip over to a name like NVIDIA and this for me has position trade, you know, all over it, written all over right. it. Like this is my perfect candidate for a position trade. It's got absolutely everything going for it, right? The fundamentals are outrageous, right? There's no, there's no arguing with the fundamentals. There's no holes in that ship, right? Other than, you know, some of the kind of crazy theories I've seen, seen thrown around there. Uh, but leading sector, leading industry, leading theme, hottest theme I've seen in years and years and years and years, right? So, um, and a, a mega cap stock that is, you know, while it's volatile, it's, it's unlikely to have a 30% gap down, right? So that, that like some uh, smaller volume names have. So that this ticks all the boxes for me in terms of a position trade. Uh, so this was one, you know, me and the rest of the universe were watching this, right? Um, and I remember actually saying in a lot of my videos, this was moving sideways along with Microsoft. They both looked like they were, you know, I always remember think both of these were consolidating like this. And I was starting to think, you know, if, if these don't get moving, you know, these, these could really quickly become from failed moves come fast moves look because they mm -hmm. were just taking their sweet time. Right. And, and the entire universe was staring at them. And in my experience, the longer <laughs> the stock takes to to make a move in one direction or the other, it kind of starts to favor the downside. In any case, as this started moving above the 20 day, there's my opportunity right there. So took it right here and I'll draw the little arrow. Uh, just to make it a little bit more clear. So took this right here, my usual tight stop um, below previous days low. This is on key moving averages, starting to make a move higher, you know, the base, all that stuff going for it. 
all the, uh, you know, the factors that I was just talking about going for it. In my mind, this is a position trade. Um, so this starts to move out. I still took a partial one, one, one and a half right around here. Right. And I know some people will look at me and be like, you're crazy. Um, but <laughs> this is a name, the whole universe is watching breaking out of an extraordinarily obvious level. Um, I'm taking, I'm paying myself, I'm paying myself. And to me, that's what allows me to hold on. So not once have I thought here about getting out of this, you know, the way I would think of a swing trade, you know, the way that I would, I would be trying to set up a, a target probably based on a measured move from the low here, et cetera, et cetera, which, which actually comes out to around this area. So I took one partial here and I took one partial here and I'm still in half of this trade. Um, and I took the partial here because to me, that's looking greedy to me, right? A couple gaps. This is, it's now out to, what is it? 17 R. So that's, you know, going back to those kind of common sense rules I had, I take my first partial, then take my, took, took another partial as it got all the way out here. And I, so I've got half this trade on and I will be following the, uh, uh, 20 day moving average as my soft stop. Right. And we'll see. So it's just a completely different thing. Like, so will this wet weather, weather, excuse me, a meaningful pullback. That's the idea here. Is this trade going to weather a meaningful pullback now, or is it going to take me out below the 20 day? That, that's, that's what remains to be seen. And the only thing I can do is follow my plan, but it's a completely different mindset. I would have gotten out of Dodge here. I would have certainly been out uh, by here if this was a swing trade. So it's just completely different. And you can see how the environment is morphing as well. You know, because when, when I was showing you MDB, that was back in November, the days back here where the market was looking quite bad actually back here, right? And then it does the absolute reversal and puts on the thrusters to the upside. And this is, you know, a different, a different environment we're dealing with here where I feel more comfortable taking a position trade like this. But the management, the management is what I'm talking about. Like not once do I question this. In fact, when I make my daily videos, you know, I just put this up there for a second. I say, there's nothing for me to do. Nothing for me to do, right? This is a position. Yep. I'm, not, I'm just not thinking about it. That's not, you know, and then I'll talk about the swing trades and how I'm managing those, but this is just completely different. Um, and this is one that works, right? You can obviously have a position trade that, that completely, you know, reverses on you right here. And I've had plenty of them that completely reverse on you and come right back in, right? This just happens to be one that works. Uh, so it's very easy to manage. Um, and then AMD similar, I'm not, I'm going to try to speed it up here as I know we've gone on for a while. Um, so this was an opportunistic entry. Where is my entry here? I have erased it. That's not cool. Let me recreate it. This will not be exact, but this is kind of burned in my memory as well. Right around here. This was when uh, there was overnight news. Was that earnings? What's that? Did it have was that on earnings, that, that reversal bar? or No, was this was news? on overnight news that they had some new chips that like they were going gotcha. to try to compete with NVIDIA in China. And mm -hmm. like it was announced the night before and the name wasn't doing all that much. And then the next day it gapped up and, you know, went bonkers. Right. So this, this again is not an if X, then Y type of, of situation where I had this, you know, set up with a trigger ready to go. This was opportunistic is, you know, what I'll call it, where I'm staring at it and it presents an opportunity. And the opportunity obviously is that news coming in. There was a ton of volume coming in, um, opened at the 20 day and started to push higher through the previous day's high, took a shot at it. Right. I actually even posted these entries on Twitter strangely, which is something I don't normally do, but sometimes I like to just be transparent, right? And, and kind of try to show people that I, that, you know, I'm not one of those people that has absolutely no integrity, right? So that's, that's part of the, part of the game, right? And I understand people are very skeptical and they have reason to be considering there's a lot of BS out there. In any case, entered here, the entry is a whole different ball game. And in my brain, this is where I say you either plan it ahead of time or very quickly after, because very, very quickly, this, this uh, scream to me, position trade, right? Hmm. The, the massive volume, the news, the fact that it is in the right sector, the right industry, the right theme, all of that screams position mm -hmm. trade to me. AMD, I consider to be more volatile than NVIDIA. Um, you know, after trading this for years, this thing, this thing can be very volatile, but I, this is by no means, you know, one of those like stocks that trades half a million shares a day and, you know, can gap all over the place, 30% here and there, right? So this again, screamed to me position trade for a whole host of reasons that I just mentioned, right? So again, partial quickly, right? And here's where I'll show you where I completely screwed up. So I took a partial, was planning on uh, holding this, and, and I wouldn't call it screwed up because screwed up is the wrong nomenclature. I followed my plan. And in hindsight, that did not, <laughs> you know, that was not the best, uh, you know, uh, move to make to maximize my outcome, but it was still following my plan. So here's where, here's where that happened. So all is moving smoothly. The idea is to ride the 20 day. Um, and MD, AMD has a fickle relationship with the 20 day. That's for sure. So that is, that's kind of a, it's kind of a tight soft stop to have probably a looser soft stop would have definitely been the 50 day, but I was going on the 20 day. 
Um, and here's where the new year started, right? So that's when, when suddenly everything flushed down the toilet in the first two weeks of January. And this just absolutely fell to the ground, right? And this was a, uh, where's, my, where's my thing? So this was already out substantially um, to a, a decent R. You know, so this had, this had run out to 9R, right? And then came back real quickly mm-hmm. to a 3.75R, right? And so me following my rules, I let it go this day. Second day, still closed below the 20-day. I had to take some off. I had, so instead of closing the entire account, I took some off defensively, right? And in hindsight, you'd be like, well, that's exactly where you add, right? But for my rules, a, a material close below the 20-day, this fits that bill two days in a row. I took some off, right? So I took a little bit off. So I, I'm dealing with half a position at this point, and it keeps motoring. Um, and since then, I've taken some off. I, I believe I took some off on this day, um, and it keeps motoring, right? And, and so now we're out to... But 15R, right? So this is an example of, you know, my mindset is completely different. As a, I remember, uh, you know, making some videos where I was saying, if I was a swing trader, if I was a swing trade, if this was a swing trade, I'd have been out here because that's mm-hmm. a nice, a nice move in short order. Um, and I would be happy to book those gains. And if I had, a, if I had a partial running, I'd have been out on this day on that move down lower, right? So this is the difference in management. It's the hundred percent difference in management, right? Because in a swing trade, I'd be, I'd be happy to have gotten that in terms of, uh, duration and expectations, and I'd have taken it before a meaningful pullback happens. Again, that dance. Here's the meaningful pullback. That's definitely a meaningful pullback. For a swing trade, I want to be out before that happens. For a position trade, you want to be able to see how much of those, how deep of a pullback you can weather and keep it on. And in this case, in hindsight, you know, I made a, I made a judgment call and, and took some off in an area in hindsight where clearly it would have been ideal to add, right? But that's, that's the way I was following my plan. And then it took off. And the only reason I was able to hold this is because of the way I managed it. Because I know myself well enough. There's no way I would have I would held a full position through that. There's absolutely zero way I would have held a, th- a full position through this drawdown, down to the 20-day, and all the way back up. Would not happen for me. So I was following my rules. Um, and, and making the decision on day one to handle this as a position trade is the only way that worked. Because uh, if this was a swing trade that I had decided upon, uh, I'd have been out right around here. So these are the massive differences, right? And now here as it consolidates again, if I were to take this again, a nice double inside day here on the 20-day um, on decreased volume, if I were to take that again, it's so far from my initial entry, that would just be a completely separate trade, right? So um, these are you know, just trying to highlight some differences between, um, you, can, you can have a favorable outcome um, and then see the name continue to run, and that does not mean you handled the trade poorly. I firmly, firmly, firmly believe that. And you can have an unfavorable out- outcome, and that does not mean you, you handled the trade poorly, right? As long as you are uh, sticking by a plan and aligning with your strategy, um, that is what is really, really important. I hope that that resonates with some people out there because for me, uh, making that decision really early on in the trade, as early as humanly possible, is one of the ways that I'm able to manage these trades to what I consider to be you know, my maximum. Right. There's always going to be mistakes. There's always going to be things you look back on and you wish you did differently. But um, it's always the way that psychologically I'm going to be able to manage them. Um, and then just real quick, like here's an example of one that gets you, you just get thwarted on. Here's SMPS. Took this uh, very recently as a swing trade. Nice. Took my partial right back to break even cut me out. Right. So there's the volatility yep. in that. So this is this is a lower volume name. Um, it's not super low volume. It, it's uh, high price stock. So it's got high average daily uh, dollar volume. But this is a, a much more volatile name, so this would not be a position trade candidate for me. Uh, but here's an example of that sw- kind of swing trade mentality where I took my partial. And the reason I take my partial at one and one, one and a half hours is because I will see a ton of these. I will see an absolute ton of these. And if I want to get back into it, I'll get back into it. I didn't get back into this because Cadence is actually reporting earnings tomorrow, and they're kind of like sister companies. Um, uh, so anyway, I just want to show an example of, you know, I could show a million of these versus you know the, the really successful ones that I just showed, right? And that's why I take a partial of one or one and a half hour in addition to the psychological value that it gives me. Um, and you know, that's something that I've developed over years and years and years to know about myself. Uh, I, think, yeah. I think that largely wraps it up. I, th- I hope the main points are, I'm looking for you know, weekly charts versus daily charts and position versus swing. And I think that the you know, locking in on a plan and how you're gonna manage it, have manage a trade early on can really keep you from having a very confused or uh, non-existent plan as you manage it. Um, and I, I, that caused me a lot of trouble um, where, where you take a trade and then you're like, oh, I'm just going to figure it out. 
I'm going to let this thing go. I think that gets you in a lot of trouble. I like to have general common sense rules that align with the, the uh, kind of type of trade I'm taking. No, I, I think this is really good. And I think going through the trades and, and showing the charts kind of brings it all together. Uh, I do want to ask kind of a follow-up to, to see if I can squeeze some more information out of you, Matt, um, in terms of you know how you decide between the swing trade, what's a swing trade candidate versus a position trade candidate. You've mentioned volatility. You've mentioned the overall setup. Uh, but are there any other criteria that you really take a look at? Because, for instance, the PLTR trade that you did, it was kind of earlier in the cycle where it was still kind of proving itself. But for me, looking at, you know, the story, it has some AI themes going on. For me, that's more of a position trade candidate. And that's me personally. Right. Um, um, so any, anything else that you want to add about how you how you make that judgment call? Obviously, it's definitely a gray area. But anything else that you kind of consider when you're when you're uh, thinking about that equation? Yeah, for me, I think over the years, I've gotten a bit more conservative. There's no doubt. Um, and I, I, I don't, you know, I think some people specifically want to target the, the very high ADR names. And for me, this is just, this is just too, too volatile fast. for me. It's just yeah. too volatile for me to have a position trade in. Um, and, and none of it had to do with pretending like I have any predictive power whatsoever, right? Uh, but in my brain, you know, this is going to have some serious drawdowns. <laughs> this is going to have some serious volatility is what I'm expecting. I mean, you know, maybe that won't happen. But for me, that kind of takes it out of the realm that I really want to dig into with a position trade, right? So I'm, I'm and, and honestly, in these candidates, these names that are higher volatility, I find you know, you're going to get those fast moves. You know, they, they can yep. be really perfect swing trade candidates because you're going to get those really fast, quick, short order moves. But with those really fast, quick, short order moves, the upside, Frequently, you get those big, violent snapbacks too, and and just for me, um, you know, I like sleep, right? So I don't. <laughs> I, it's just something that I've developed over time. There's no reason you couldn't take it as a position trade, obviously, and there's no there's no like handbook for it. But for me, the reason I didn't do that is because, you know, this is a volatile name. There's there's no doubt. And for in my book, this is a very volatile name, um, and I'm looking for, you know, a, a, a little bit more. Uh, I won't say sure footedness, but something that like is very unlikely to have a meaningful gap down, you know, out of out of the blue, because that is something if you've ever had that happen once or twice or three times, it, it leaves a scar and, and should really make you have second thoughts about, um, you know, your risk management. Right. And, and for, so for me also in a name, you know, maybe not Palantir, but there are some names that you start to be because this has really good volume, but there's some names that are like lower volume or there are big spreads. Or I'm going to size down just because of the name that it is, right? Right. Just because of that volatility, and because in my experience, when people want to look for the exits, it's it's everybody at once wants to look for the exit, and that yeah. sp spread is going to get real wide, and you're going to get a horrible fill, and you're not going to be able to get out uh, at well, right? So those are names that I'll even size down on. Never mind, not even consider taking a position trade on. But again, that's me, and everybody has to have their own their own flavor, right? I know there's there's some people that would be like. This is my dream position trade, a name that with this volatility. For me, that's not that's not what I'm looking for. Yeah. So just to kind of rephrase what you're saying and, and correct me if I'm wrong at any point, but you're kind of looking for the smoother rides with the position trades. And yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. it's almost it's 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 everything is through the risk management lens for me. Right. So yep. I, I think there's a bigger risk of some big material gap or a big a substantial pullback in, in a name like Palantir. Right. Whereas let's look at AMD. This is by no means like a, a, you know, a soft little ride here. This is all, this can be very, very volatile and all over the place. But to me, this is probably less likely to give me some sort of massive gap down or some, you know, a day where, you know, there are some, th this is just interesting to me. There, you know, there's a lot of people that focus on the growth names, as you know, and like, and the, the high ADR names. And then those same people will, will say that options are, are very, 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 are way too risky, right? Yet you'll look at some of these growth names and there will be a candle that's like 35%. It's a 35% move. And, and I'd argue that that is a level of risk that can be, start to become akin to options trading. There's no doubt. And I, and I just look through everything as a risk management lens. And I prefer to be in a name where I feel much more comfortable that there's not going to be some 30% uh, candle. You know, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, examples would be, let's see. Um, even SMCI, right? Even after this huge move, there were some whopper candles here. You know, yep. the, this, this is a name that I wouldn't position trade either. And this is personal, right? And this, this comes down to my personal taste, right? This one, 
for a 12% candle. So not as big um, as I was thinking, but there's other names here I can, I can get to that had humongous candles, you know? Um, and these are names that are going to be off my list of position trading. You know, there's a 14% mm -hmm. candle right there. Anything that can move with that volatility. Um, and, and there's names that definitely have, I think AI, AI will be a good 30% candle mover. Yeah, I had a few of those, I think. Yeah, so a anything that can even remotely come close to this kind of, that's 14%, but... If you go back a, a month, there's one of those. Yeah, there's definitely names that do this type of thing, right? And that, that's yeah. immediately, that's immediately yeah. a no-go for me because that's, that's just not the kind of risk management that I want to employ, right? Um, and if I'm going to try to get something um, where I want leverage like that, I'll use options. And that's a whole different can of wax. But if I, if I want leverage, I'll use options. I don't want to get into a, a name like that um, with a meaningful position size that I think can, that can suddenly move around like an EKG on me, you know? And that's not to say NVIDIA and AMD can't be, can't be volatile and that I, that I am trying to get into the most boring stocks ever because that's not at all what I'm trying to do. I mean, I think we'd all agree NVIDIA and AMD are leaders, right? So, but I'm trying to get in leaders that, that fit with my risk tolerance. Yeah, and just to add a little bit, um, and this is something that uh, terminology that, that Ray has kind of taught me, there's the market leaders, which is more your NVIDIA and AMD. And then what you're kind of swing trading, he kind of, he, he, clarif he classifies as performance enhancers, where it's often in that same leading theme, but it's a, it's a lesser quality name that maybe is more volatile, uh, you know, higher ADR, whatever. And he's just looking for that quick move to, to basically add some performance while he's holding the cores and the leaders. So I think it's, it's pretty much the same perspective uh, that yeah, you kind I of think talked I look about at today. It a little bit differently. Cause I don't think I would mm -hmm. like tier them like that. Like they're lesser in some way. Cause I'm, I'm happy to sw swing trade like meta or something that, you know, something that is, it could be somebody's core position. I'm still right. happy to swing trade that. Right. Because I don't want my, my account tied up entirely in, in position trades. So for, for, for me, it's much more about um, drawdown risk um, and turning over my account, right? So I don't, I don't necessarily look at it as like, these are the, these are the cores that, love that like, I, I guess I don't presume to, to say like, these are the ones, you know what I mean? Like, I'm okay yeah. with saying like, these are the names I wanna be in with the position trade, but I, I, there are plenty of other names that I think are really high quality names that I will happily swing trade instead of position trade. Um, because I will never go up to that level where my account is mainly filled with position trades because for me, swing trading is something that is a sweet spot for me. So um, I wouldn't necessarily consider them lesser names, but you can certainly, and I think what he's, he, you know, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but for me, I would look at it as there are some, you know, some major movers like, you know, like a Carvana, which I'm actually yep. at the moment. That to me is not something I'm going to hold uh, for me because yep. the volatility is massive. I'm happy to swing it. And I would call this a lesser name personally for me, right? Because this is a, for me, it's nothing but a short squeeze name. You know, um, this is not the right theme, I'll, at least for now, right? Maybe this company is going to absolutely change and go crazy, but at least for now, this is, um, you know, something that I would classify as a performance enhancer, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Right? No, no, same thing. I, I think same perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think that makes sense. I just, I, I guess the only distinction I would make is that um, my main deciding factor is how much volatility I want in my account with those position trades. And that's why, that's why I just won't have that many. Gotcha. No, this has been excellent, Matt. Uh, appreciate you going through all the different trades. Um, taking a step back, if you had to talk to your early self when you were first learning about trading and like thinking about how to manage positions and trying to figure that out, what advice would you give yourself to help give yourself some clarity? Uh, I love kind of uh, the, the simplicity that you that you kind of talked about today and, and the power in that. Uh, but yeah, what, what would you kind of what advice would you give yourself about position management that maybe newer traders out there could benefit from? Yeah, I mean, I think that's always the lens I'm trying to look through when I when I you know speak with you or, or speak with anybody is that's the message I'm trying to get across. Right. So I think that I think that overall having having that understanding of being aligned with what you're trying to do is, is so critical. And that's something that I was not good at in the beginning. I was not good. at. I did not have a clear picture of being alive. It, it wasn't even a concept in my brain, you know, like, um, it wasn't something that I was thinking of in that, in those terms or in the spirit of it. Right. So I was just thinking, how do I, how do I, you know, make the most money as I possibly can? You know, I've, you, I think you focus a lot on entries. I think you focus a lot on setups. I think then you start to focus on environment. I think this is something that people don't necessarily focus on, or it's a little bit of an afterthought. And for me, I think it's really, really important. And I've worked with enough, uh, new traders to understand and to, to really see that there's a lot of confusion. 
uh, because people are not being not aligned with with their with their plan. And you know those simple things I brought up in the very beginning, like you know every swing trade's got you got to let it run forever. You know, let your winners run, let them all let them all run, except they all come back and you know eighty percent of them are going to come back and take you out of break even. You know, um, and and I think that the psychology, the benefits psychologically of having these simple common sense ways of aligning with things. Um, I think can really, really help your trading, your trade management, um, especially if you are somebody who does both swing and position trading, right? So I think if I was, you know, going back to my early self, I would give myself this, this slideshow. Like that's, that's the only way I can create this is, is thinking like, what would I have liked to have heard 20 years ago, right? So I think that, you know, having those, that simple delineation of what am I trying to do when you enter a trade or very shortly after you enter a trade is a very, very simple way of, of then being able to follow your plan. And the, the only foothold you have in the market is your plan. The market's going to do what it's going to do. But the only way you're interacting in the market is by following your plan. And if you're unsure about what your plan is, uh, it's likely to lead, in a, lead to a lot of uh, bad decisions. Yeah, it, it brings clarity and peace of mind to, to think things through beforehand. And otherwise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect your psyche. Like we've talked about, it's going to be harder to hold and actually fulfill your plan if you don't right. have, you know, take that partial or whatever your system is. And it just adds stress to, to the whole endeavor. So, uh, yeah, I think this is super valuable, Matt. Appreciate you coming on for sure. Uh, great to have you back. Um, if people want to reach out to you or learn more, learn more from you, where, where can they uh, – what, what's the best place to contact you? Um, so I am on X uh, at The Equilibrium, which you brought up in the beginning, um, Even Keeled Mindset at The Equilibrium. Um, so that's where I am on X, and I have a site, uh, which is Trading Equilibrium as well. So you can email me there or – take a look around the site or reach out to me on X and that's primarily where I am. Yep. Perfect. We'll have those links down below. Uh, Matt, again, appreciate you coming on. I think everybody uh, out there will really appreciate this, um, especially the newer traders. I think this is really, really valuable. Uh, so if you did find this presentation helpful, uh, definitely check out Matt uh, at his links down below. Uh, leave a like down below on this video. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more great interviews uh, and presentations like we had with uh, Matt today. So thank you guys all for tuning in. And we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care.